Hi everyone, my name is Alex. Today um, I would like to take you through um, the work that we do in the Department of Business and Trade. Um, so earlier today I uh, came into the room for a moment and I've heard someone say, um, I'm not wearing my hoodie today because that's what I'm supposed to do, that's what hackers do. Well clearly I'm not a hacker, um, so I'm not going to do any code walkthroughs. Um, I won't take you through anything overly technical, but I'd like to give you a bit of an oversight of what we're doing in um, the Department of Business and Trade on an R&D program called the National Digital Twin Program. Um, Today I'm joined by um, Alex, who is the head of the program, and I'm the deputy head of the program. Um, in terms of what we're covering, um, we just want to cover a couple of things and to encourage you to uh, engage with the program and to have a bit of a look online to see what we're doing and some, some of our suppliers and partners. Um, we'll cover a little bit about the program, the history of the program, um, how long we've been around, what we do, what our focus is. Can you hear me okay back there? Yeah. Not, not so good. I'll, I'll see if I can move this up a bit. How's that? All right, good. Um, then we'll talk a bit about something called the integration architecture, which is really the backbone of the uh, national digital twin or the national digital twin that we are working towards. Um, and we'll cover uh, policy-based access control. We'll explain what that is and what it means to the program and kind of how it evolved from um, access, uh, attribute-based access control and role-based access control. And we want to talk a bit about zero trust principles and secure by design and the importance of security in the integration architecture. Um, so I'll start off with a bit of background on the program. Um, this is an R&D program that started in 2018. Um, and um, it recently, in 2022, completed uh, what we call phase one. So it completed a phase of work where it really released some really important papers. Um, the Gemini Principles is such a paper, and a pathway towards information management framework. Um, so these are available online. You can download, you can have a look. They basically set out uh, the things to pursue in order for the UK to achieve a national digital twin, or to have this as a digital asset that is available to government, it's available to society, it's available to SMEs, and so on. Um, in, uh, in 2023, in 2022, my mistake, in 2023, we began phase two. Um, and phase two is really taking all of those great ideas and making them practical. And actually running, um, running those ideas through a program that is focused on pragmatic delivery. Um, all the way from how do, we, how do we actually develop this? How do we develop that technical backbone? How do we develop the operating frameworks to support this? How do we develop the right processes? Um, and the program really has four um, key areas. So um, we're looking at um, operating frameworks. Um, for this to work as a, pro as a concept, as a national digital twin, we really need to have commercial frameworks in place. We need to have legal frameworks in place. How do you enable data sharing? How do you bring in you know, private data, open data, secure data, and also so on and so forth? Um, and um, technology frameworks and a variety of other frameworks. And in doing so, we've engaged with a lot of specialists over the last year. So we've engaged with maybe about 40 to 50 organizations and um, SMEs across the spectrum. So some of these would be uh, deeply technical people, some of, the, uh, some of them would be um, business experts and so on. Uh, data and technology, so we'll cover that in a bit more detail um, in a second. This is really around the integration architecture. It's around um, how we bring it all together, how we make sure that it's fit for purpose, and how we use real-life cases and real-life challenges to develop this as an asset. The third one is around school, uh, skills, comms, and engagement, and this is really um, ensuring that other initiatives that are concurrent, that are happening at the same time in government and outside, are in alignment to what it is that we're doing, so that we um, develop a product that is compatible with um, the ideas that are emerging in the market by SMEs, but also other government departments who have significant areas of development in the field of digital twins. Um, and last but not least, we have a demonstrator program. And to many, this will be the most exciting bit that we do. Um, we are taking um, real life problems and real life challenges like net zero. Um, and we spend time with pe people in different sectors to understand how digital twinning technologies and processes might help solve that problem. So rather than start with, you know, digital twins are the answers, what is the problem? We go the other way around. Say, right, well, give us a real life case. Give us a use case that we can work with, and we'll try to run it through uh, the digital twin um, and develop a methodology while we do that, develop a playbook. So we have um, four demonstrators in total. We have one um, around retrofitting and housing, and that really started with the challenge posed by Net Zero. So we looked at, at Net Zero and we looked at the sectors that are um, 
uh, when you run a bit of analysis and you look at the greatest producers of carbon, um, we've identified those sectors. The biggest one is housing, according to the ONS. Then you have energy production and transport, so we've picked housing, and we've had a look at the quality of housing stock in the UK. I thought, right, well, there's a problem here. How can we start to use digital models or digital shadows or digital twins to support the organization that can have the greatest deg degree of influence in improving it? So we've um, spoken with retrofitting companies. We spoke with voluntary sector organizations. We spoke with local authorities, we've got them all in a room, we've done a lot of ideation and workshopping to understand what the issue is. And then from there, how do we develop a solution that helps them solve that problem? How do we get to a point where we use digital technologies to give them access to data so they can make um, f rapid decisions and, and um, support those that live in substandard um, conditions? We have another um, demonstrator in the energy system. So this is uh, uh, in the Isle of Wight, the same as all of our other demonstrators, and it, it's focused specifically on the generation of 300 megawatts of renewable energy. Um, we have um, another demonstra uh, demonstrator on asset resilience with a focus on flooding and technology. And last but not least, we're looking at the sharing of really sensitive data across organizational boundaries. And as you can tell, I'm getting closer to secure, safe, and um, kind of the, the, the topic at hand. Um, so, these are um, some of the principles that we've developed. Last year, as I mentioned, we've engaged with a lot of organizations, many different organizations that pointed us and gave us um, a steer, gave us suggestions, gave us recommendations for how we drive the program itself. Um, and we develop a suite of principles for how digital twins should be de developed. Uh, so those are what we call the development attributes, but we've also developed a series of uh, delivery principles. There are seven in total, but I wanted to share these four with you, more specifically the two that I've highlighted in yellow. So as we've engaged with this you know, massive group of people over the last year to understand how we drive this roadmap and how we develop, how, how we embrace a series of principles for the program, what was really clear and what came, um, what came through is uh, we need to promote open reusable assets and we release them incrementally. Um, and also, we need to pr uh, prioritize accessibility and inclusivity. Those are things that were really, um, really important to the people that we spoke with. And this is a blend of people in government, um, SMEs, people in voluntary sector, um, open source organizations, um, technologists, etc. Um, if you want to read them in detail and slow time, there's a link at the bottom as well. Um, but in essence, this is what really drove us to make a lot of decisions when it comes to the technology that we use in the program. So in developing the code, in developing the integration architecture, we use um, suppliers, we use the private sector. And again, this is a bit of a blend. Some are really small organizations, some are really large. And the one thing that we always wonder whenever we commission anyone to work with us, whenever we develop that next module in the integration architecture is, can we have this be open? Can we share it with others? Can we make it available to others who might experience the same problem or difficulties? How do we uh, promote accessibility and inclusivity? How do we, and this is one that comes back time and time again, how do we lower barriers to adoption? Um, and that's all well and good, but obviously um, security is important. And um, as a principle, digital twins must be secure and they must enable the, the safe and secure data sharing across um, organizational boundaries. Now. Um, here we are, the, the integration architecture. Um, so the integration architecture is um, a product that has been in development now for a, a number of years. We're using a, uh, an SME to develop it. And it's, it has a number of components. But in essence, what it does is it's enabling the um, safe and secure data sharing across organizational boundary. And at this stage, at this point in time, it is the most um, digitally mature asset that enables data sharing in government across multiple departments. So there are a number of platforms that will enable data sharing within a single organization. But when you're looking at disseminating data across, that becomes really difficult and it becomes really problematic. Um, so, the um, integration architecture, I'll focus on a few parts of it just to give you a very brief overview. Um, what we have um, within the integration architecture, um, a cleanser resolver, a mapper, and a projector. So this is bringing data in from um, multiple organizations. This will allow you to inspect the data to make sure that it's uh, of sufficient quality. Then um, you will run it through a resolver that identifies whether that data has been um, uh, received, taken into the IA before. Um, we then map it to a common ontology. I'll come back to this common ontology um, in a moment, but we are using a 4D ontology called IES, or the Information Exchange Standard. Um, and that is available on GitHub, uh, by the way. 
um, and then we project it um, into what we call a smart cache, which is in essence a highly secure database. Um, and we do so to um, serve it via an API to a product that consumes it. More often than not, it's a visualization of some form. So these different demonstrators that I've, um, I've outlined uh, at the beginning of the, uh, the presentation, generally speaking, have a front end because that's what people interact with. That's what users and consumers will interface with. Um, we also have um, some platform tools um, around monitoring, configuration, mapping, and provenance um, that will be baked into the integration architecture itself. And the IA, uh, uh, as we call it, is um, developed with Apache, um, uh, Apache, and it will be made available um, at some point in, in the first half of the next financial year. So we are in the process now of taking it through penetration testing um, to really make sure that what we release is, um, is fit for purpose and does what it needs to do um, and is ready for everyone to, to, to grab it, try to break it, give us feedback um, on it. Um, and in terms, of, um, in terms of why, in terms of why is open source important for us? So this statement really struck me. It's quite a recent report by the European Commission. Um, the European Commission run um, a bit of analysis on the state of digital twinning in Europe. Uh, they've excluded the UK for obvious reasons, but um, they have looked at all of the European nations to get a bit of a sense for what matters and what doesn't. And at this point in time, only 16% of the solutions um, that are utilized in digital twinning are open source. And actually, that is, that is a bit of a shame. And um, they highlight some of, the, some of the problems or some of the potential long-term problems associated with that. Obviously, that percentage should go up, and it would be good if it goes up. And one of the main reasons um, is really what, what we call you know, the network effect. And I'm, I'm sure you've heard of this before. But the value of a, of a utility or a product increases as more people use it. And to us, open source is really that way in which you lower those barriers to entry and you promote um, accessibility and you make this available to more and more people. The integration architecture is designed to be a federated system, so it's not a great digital twin of the UK and you dump all of your data in, but rather you will have multiple instances of it spread all over the place connected by a federator or by a management node. Um, so, in, in doing so, we really want to stick and adhere to that principle that we've, we developed for the program. And that's all around um, developing, developing code and developing product that is usable by as many organizations as possible and lowering barriers to adoption. And um, I'd, like to, I'd like to think that in a couple of years from now, we'll see that percentage uh, go up as more and more organizations embrace the integration architecture. I think it's worth mentioning that we are not doing this alone. So we have um, some extraordinary partners in the development of the integration architecture itself. Um, it really starts with the suppliers, and the supplier that we work with develops products across government. And their kind of motto or their ethos is, if we've developed it for government and they've paid for it once, they won't pay for it twice. Meaning if they develop a piece of work for the MOD or if they develop a piece of work for the cabinet office, we can tap into that piece of work. Likewise, everything that we develop can be made available to everyone else, uh, which is great. Um, and we also have partners across the sectors. So this is a product that um, carries a lot of weight. As I mentioned, there aren't many products that enable the secure data sharing across organizational boundaries. So um, it's being used um, in the energy sector at the moment. So the ESO have adopted it um, and are developing their own use cases based on it. Um, and we have other partners across government that also um, have deployed their own instances of the integration architecture and are developing it. So you can kind of start to see that network effect at play. And as they develop their product, everyone, every member of the, um, um, every member benefits. Um, what's really important as well, and I've mentioned I'll come back to, um, to ontologies. So um, we do have... Um, in terms of ontologies, we do have um, uh, uh, the information exchange standard, which I've mentioned earlier, and I'll share some links. I'm not sure why. I will s see if I can stop and restart my presentation because my uh, it seems to, to have run out of sync for some, some reason. Um, maybe not. So I'll carry on verbally. Um, we are using an ontology um, called the Information Exchange Standard, uh, and that's in its fourth iteration right now. It's available on GitHub. I'm sure we'll be able to share and disseminate some, um, um, some links after it. Um, the Information Exchange Standard basically allows data to come into the integration architecture and enable it to be mapped onto a common ontology. Um, it's a very versatile ontology, so at the moment we've used it in our use cases, so we've used it in retrofitting, we've, we're using it in energy system at the moment, um, and we are using it in, in terms of enabling the sharing of really sensitive data. Um, but 
we haven't yet worked in sectors like water. We haven't yet worked um, in um, sectors like energy ourselves. So we have our, our partners that are developing the ontology. As the ontology expands and develops, um, so will we have the ability to bring in data from multiple sectors and actually derive insights from it to start to combine all of these different data, um, th th these different data sources. Um, I'm having a bit of an issue. It's not resharing my screen for some reason. I'm connected, yeah. Gonna to try to unplug and plug again. You still have put in there, are you? Uh, I've just unplugged it now. Still have twist the cable there. You just do it. Yep. There you go. That's it. Go on, keep the cable. Okay. Um, we also use some open data standards, so we also use um, RDF. Um, and um, again, I'll, we'll, share some, um, we'll, we'll share some links. I'm not sure why uh, I've lost some of the links on my presentation, but what's really important that these are made available and we encourage others to cooperate and to get involved and to um, help us and um, adopt these standards so that we can extend them and bring in additional sectors um, in. Um, I'm gonna go through. Um, I won't cover, I'll, I'll go back for a second and I'll cover it verbally. What I really wanted to flag up is also the fact that we use um, a number of um, technologies that are um, open source. Um, so for example, the integration architecture is used um, using Apache, Apache Kafka, which is an event, uh, an event management tool. It's designed to cope with masses, uh, massive volumes of data. So it's designed to ingest um, you know, gigabytes, petabytes worth of data at a rapid pace. And this is really to future-proof ourselves. This is really to enable the generate and the deployment of full fat digital twins. Uh, so um, you know, the, a virtual replica of, a, uh, of an object, of a process, or of a, of a system, and to enable that two-way flow of um, communication and uh, information exchange. So um, we're also using a number of uh, databases that are, again, open source. Um, we'll share um, additional details on, um, on some of the products that we, um, some of the products that we employ. On the next bit, um, what we'd like to talk about is um, some of the uh, security design, so secure by design, and some of the other, um, so secure by design, actually, well, we'd like to share a little bit about Secure by Design and the information exchange standard and some of the security wrappers around the integration architecture and what enables that um, secure sharing of data across, um, across the IA. I'll pass over to Alex. Um, I'll go on to the next slide. I think that's... Okay, so thank you very much. So just to roll back a little bit and talk ab about sort of, I suppose, wh why is security so important to us? So what the National Digital Twin Programme is really there is got two key themes running through it. First of all, how do we make information available to people across organisational boundaries? And how do we do that in a, really, in a way that is trusted, secure and resilient? It's really important that we do that if we want people to be able to share information and there is a lot of valuable information that will be needed in order to solve problems. People People have to be able to trust that when they do that, they can do it in a way where they can protect any sensitive information that they hold and only share information with the people that they want to be able to share with. So really, how do we ensure right information available to the right people at the right time? And that importantly, the users understand the quality of the information that they are receiving so they can start making decisions about whether that information is fit for the purpose to which they want to be able to put it. The second stream that runs through the program then is how do we then start engaging with that information, visualizing it, making it accessible to users in a way that meets their need, understanding different users have different needs to be able to engage with that information. I'm an engineer, a civil engineer by background. I probably want a very different interface than maybe somebody that's very um, much more of a data engineer or somebody that is just... Uh, can't talk, a strategic decision maker. So we need to really get much better at understanding different user needs. 
But as I said, what we're doing then is then, well, actually, if we want to be able to achieve that and we want to develop all of those underpinning rules of the road that will enable people to do that, we need to be able to do it in a way that conforms with certain principles. So we need to be able to do all of this and be able to join things together in a way that is appropriately safe, secure, and trustworthy. We need to be able to do it in a way that is ethical. We also need to think about we, how we do this in a way that is sustainable, adaptable over time, and also interoperable. Now, none of that I'm pretending is easy. That's really hard stuff to do, but we have to be thinking about these things if we are going to be able to prom promulgate these, these processes and these sorts of technologies and get their wider adoption. We also have to think about the range of organizations that will need to get involved with this. And they will have different types of information that they want to be able to share, as I said, and different sensitivities of information that they want to be able to share and visualize and engage with. So we need to be able to find ways to protect information that is sensitive from it because it's maybe personal data. We also need to think about how can people share information that is commercially sensitive. And also, how can people share information with the right people that is potentially secure, that is sensitive from a national security perspective? So we have to really build from the ground up thinking about security being that fundamental requirement. So I think that really plays into this sort of first thing around secure by design. If we want to be able to do this, there's no good thinking about security as an afterthought. We need to think about security right from the start and build up from that because we know that if you don't do that, you start creating vulnerability it's far more difficult to build security in at a later date than it is when you start thinking about it, first of all. We're also, I mean, Alex has talked about the integration architecture, so this is that means by which we can start bringing information together from multiple systems, taking it through processes that start to make that information interoperable. Once that information is interoperable, it's far easier then to start sharing that, promulgating it across organizations and ensuring that an organization that receives information understands the same thing by, uh, by that information as the organization that sent it. But obviously, when you start bringing that sort of information together, you really, again, need to think about security around the system. Now, yes, you can make a technology as secure as possible, but I'm not saying that is the be-all and end-all. You clearly have to make sure that you put the um, people and physical security wrappers around that as well. But within the integration architecture, in terms of the technical security, we have adopted um, zero trust. Now, it's not there at the moment, but we're certainly pushing towards how do we get the integration architecture to be zero trust. And when we talk about zero trust, what we mean is that basically you have unique identifiers for the users, for the devices and the services or the software processes that you have. The system, nothing tr trusts anything else within the system. So it is constantly authorizing and authenticating as anything moves through the system. And this is really about stopping a hostile getting into the system and moving laterally through the system. At any point, if any of that authorization and authentication doesn't match, then the connection is broken. So that is really about trying to ensure that somebody can't get in and then move through the system and use that one point of, uh, of access, if you like, to infiltrate the entire system. Um, so, and it's about, as well, having that policy wrapper around it as well. So understanding that the system is complying with policy, so it checks around the user, what, um, what is the um, legitimate access that that user has, what is the device health like, what is the device location, do those all comply with the policy that sits within, the, that should be sitting around that, that data or that information or that system. So that's a really important element. It's really hard, and obviously zero trust isn't something, every time you add something in, obviously you have to go through the process of ensuring that you are still building zero trust in. So it's not something you probably ever get to that point of, there we go, that's done, tick, complete. Um, but it's also very then very closely linked to policy-based access control. And what we talk about with this is, so a lot of how we control access to information at the moment is around role-based access control. And that is clearly challenging. It works reasonably well within an organization. But when you want to start sharing information across organizations, it becomes very challenging. So if you give you an example of an administrator, an administrator sitting in um, a health organization within the NHS, they may be an administrator for a consultant and therefore are entitled to see and able to see information about vulnerable individuals. 
and that's fine. But then if that organisation wishes to share some information about vulnerable people with, for example, the utilities company in an emergency situation, the utilities company needs to understand that it needs to get maybe water into a property or it needs to um, look at how they can get power to a property as a priority. If there's an admin role in that utilities company, then they are not entitled to see the same sort of information as an admin role within a health service. So that becomes immediately challenging. How do you distinguish between those two roles when they are basically called the same thing? So attribute-based access control is something that is being developed and is approved by uh, National Cybersecurity Center and, and NSA in America and really starts doing fine, far more fine-grained security. So it looks at the attributes that an individual has, and it looks at the attributes on the data. And effectively, the two things have to match. If the two things don't match, you don't get access to that information. So it allows you to control who can see what down to a really fine-grained level within that data. So down to an individual cell within a table, a node or a line on a graph, etc. What policy-based access control does is to layer something over the top of that that then looks at policy, human readable policy, and uses that to influence the attributes that sit against the individual and or against the data itself. So it's a way of trying to, um, I suppose, make that attribute-based access control slightly less painful, uh, slightly more um, automated. I suppose. Um, so it's an advancement really on, on ABAC security. So all of these things coming together is really around that, making this integration architecture that means by which we can start doing that information sharing across organizational boundaries as secure as possible, but while doing that in a way that, as Alex has said, using all of that open source um, that means that we can that people can use this, any this will be accessible to anybody um, to use not just across government, but across the, the rest of the public sector and the private sector as well. In terms of next steps, Alex mentioned that we'll be pushing this out, we'll be pushing the first version of the integration architecture out um, early in the new financial year. We've got to do some penetration testing around that. Obviously, from a departmental perspective, they want to be confident that we're not going to put some, some code out there that's going to have massive great holes in it. Um, so and that's really important for us as well to make sure we're pushing out the best, the best thing that we can. And it will be a, a continual process. So we'll be doing further drops on that. We've also got to look at how you do this across as a distributed system. So looking at that sort of overall management of this as well. And we will also, we develop a number of other products. Everything that we do, or as much as possible as what we do, is open source. We really believe that is, that is what we should be doing. And therefore, we will also be pushing out other assets at, um, that we develop through the program over time as well. So I'm now one minute out from the end of the our time slot. Thank you very much for staying on to listen. I appreciate it's end of day, as the previous speaker said. Um, so I appreciate everybody's probably very tired and wants to get home. But thank you very much. Hopefully it was useful. If you want any further information, do go to our website. And there is a, um, an email address on there that you can contact us with. Thank you very much.